Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Neophagy. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private property, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this last episode of the Summer Climate Change Series of 2022, I have the pleasure of uh, talking with Professor David Harvey, uh, which he has been uh, already once in the show. And the reason that I invited him is, was to talk uh, one of the key concepts that he has been uh, working with since the 1970s, which is the topic or the concept of the metabolic relationship of nature to nature of, uh, between capital humans and, and of course, the planet. Um, David Harvey is a distinguished professor of geography and anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. His work into the fields of anthropology, geography, Marxist studies, political economy, urban studies and cultural studies have made him one of the most influential thinkers alive. Over his lifetime, Professor Harvey has been dedicated to the production and transfer of critical knowledge to academics and the general public alike. Uh, among his academic work, he has published 26 books, uh, up right now to the 27th, which we'll be talking uh, about it. Uh, his uh, field book on the Grundrisse, Marxist Grundrisse. Many of these 27 books have been incredibly influential in the humanities and the social sciences, as well as in the arts and the design fields. He uh, is recipient of 12 honorary doctorates. And in 2019, he was granted the Leverhulme Gold Medal of the British Academy for creative contributions to the social sciences. I also regard him as perhaps the most important urban thinker uh, in modern history. Hello, David. It's really a pleasure to have you back again. You were the first guest uh, of this podcast series. Okay. And I thought it was uh, very, very relevant to bring you back, especially on the topics that I've been discussing the last four podcasts, which had to do with the environmental crisis that we are all at. Um, I've touched different topics, um, uh, specifically trying to unpack a lot of the things that capitalists tell us that they're good or that they're solving the crisis, but in reality, they're saying us, I think, sometimes back or the core questions are not the ones that are being asked. For example, I dedicate a whole episode on, on discussing mobility and electric vehicles and all of that type of stuff and how in reality they're just masks, you know, they're just a cover uh, of a lot of the processes that are truly destroying the planet, you know, and making us believe that we're doing something um, very positive, right, as we consume, basically, you know. Uh, last uh, week, uh, I decided to dedicate a whole episode on discussing and critiquing the idea of circular economy. And in, when discussing the circular economy, it's, very, it's a very similar thing. It's a concept that's created by capitalists, for capitalists, for a very specific purpose, which is the purpose of growth, you know, and capitalist growth and profit and, and valuing, uh, in this case, trash and recycling and getting as much profit from it as possible. Um, but I thought that something was missing in this uh, series of podcasts, which was a concept that you picked up um, early in your work uh, from Marx. And um, I, I know that you started to pick up already in your works in the 1970s um, uh, on the topic of environmental, the environmental question. And later you started to discuss also questions of the metabolic relation to nature from Marx. Um, now, I don't want to start there yet. Um, I want to uh, start first, uh, perhaps with a historical uh, question, which is, how was it in the 1970s, the discourse? Because uh, as far as I can remember, I was very young. Um, a, Marx was uh, not very popular with environmentalists, right, at all. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was the opposite. No, it, was a, it was accused of being you know, in favor of development and in, in favor of the destruction of nature vis-a-vis -vis the benefit of man, right? Uh, let's put it this way. And 
I wonder when you started writing, um, let's say, from social justice in the city and things that you started to work in the 70s, what do you remember was the discourse back then uh, from environmentalism vis-a-vis Marx? Well, f- first off, there was um, uh, an obvious uh, emergence of uh, uh, interest in the environmental question during the 1960s, uh, you know, even going back to Rachel Carson and uh, that sort of thing, and Barry Commoner. And Barry Commoner was a kind of leftist. Uh, he had a sort of background, uh, sympathy with with Marx. So there was, there was that there. But uh, you're right that when Earth Day came in uh, 1972, I think it was, um, it was grasped by everybody. I mean, you know, President Richard Nixon wrote a piece in Fortune magazine and all that kind of thing. So uh, understandably, uh, when you looked at it, you would see most of the people who were concerned with the environmental movement were middle class and young and the right. So immediately there was a sort of sense that somehow or other this was uh, kind of a bourgeois movement uh, rather than a, a left uh, movement, even though the movement was quite uh, radical. Yes, uh, and and was uh, you know prepared to take uh, direct action. Uh, so there were the, uh, the the Abbey group that was into sort of um, you know disruptive uh, stuff around uh, the environment. So the environment was there, and so uh, this was a time when I was learning about Marx and was working on uh, you know, getting my Marx uh, together after social justice in the city and. It seemed to me that, uh, given my background in geography, it would be obvious thing to start to think about the relationship between uh, physical geography and the physical geographical environment and and Marx, and that got me into uh, thinking about uh, thinking about various aspects of that. Yes. And so I started to write on uh, on that. But you're correct. Also, um, I remember uh, running into quite a few uh, leftists at the time, Maoists in particular who were very antagonistic uh, to the environmental stuff and is essentially t- treated as petty bourgeois romanticism. So, so there was a, a, a strong current within the left itself, which uh, at that time, of course, was located in the Soviet Union where Stalin had basically taken the view that you know, the environment is there to be used and mastered, and that was it. So the, yes, the, the modernist the pr- principles. Pr- Promethean, yeah. The Promethean yeah. view was, was in practice in the Soviets, and so I can understand why people were, were, were antagonistic to that. But on the other hand, it seemed to me that there was uh, a real issue to be, to be debated, and I started to investigate it step by step initially. Uh, by going back and looking at Malthus in, in particular and looking at the contrast between Malthus and Marx and the question of Malthus and Marx was with me Yes, yes. Uh, during those years very strongly. Yeah, and during that time, uh, again, as I was either a baby or wasn't born yet, but I, historically speaking, uh, in the 60s, there's a very strong movement that happens from the feminist perspective, uh, uh, especially Marxist feminists, actually, that, uh, in my view, there were some of the few people or few intellectuals from the Marxist side that were starting to take the environmental question much more seriously from a Marxist perspective. Yes. And as you say, yes. most certainly the, the discourse, <laughs> perhaps because of Stalin, as you mentioned, or Althusser, or anything that had to do with that type of modernist Marxism, was not taken, uh, taking it serious, right? right. You were amongst, certainly in the 1970s, the uh, first intellectuals that started to discuss um, the, the relationships that Marx saw with the environment vis-a-vis his construction of nature um, and metabolic relations to nature and so forth, right? Uh, but I think it was your book um, uh, on uh, nature and geography. Uh, what is it? Uh, Justice, Justice, nature, nature and, and the geograph- geography, 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 geography of difference, difference right? Yes. Uh, ni- 1996, 1996, yes. 1996 that uh, you took that uh, question of the environment and Marx like much more at the, let's say, at the core of your work. Yeah. From the 1970s to, the, to that period of 1996, what was it that led you to that book? I mean, that do you say, like, I have to dedicate a complete book on this question? 
Uh, well, I, I, in some respects, it was a, a response to certain criticisms I, I had because during the 1980s, uh, I was writing and I came up with the condition of postmodernity, which created a considerable uh, response. Yes. A very negative response on the part of cer certain wings of feminism. And so I was in the, I was in the doghouse as far as uh, feminists were concerned. And so I was thinking very much of uh, looking into that. And of course, as you correctly pointed out, uh, there was a very strong e ecological feminism at the time. Uh, People like Carolyn Merchant yes, and, and yes. so on, uh, and and, and uh, so I, I decided I yeah I had not taken feminism seriously enough, and but in the process uh, I wanted to also come to terms with uh, uh, the, the ecological feminism that was uh, a very 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 strong. So so in a sense after the condition of post modernity the question was where would i go and what would i do and i thought that it was very important to be more explicit about dialectics and yes. to get my method uh, straight uh, to continue on the marx course but to integrate it with uh, environmental understandings feminist understandings try to bring a lot, a lot of that together so that's what i was trying to do in justice, nature, and the geography of difference. Yeah, there's something very, um, I think, special about that book, which um, you talk about method, right? And previous podcasts, I've been very interested in trying to explain to my audience about the importance of dialectics. But one thing that is very difficult to, uh, well, not difficult, is you don't find a moment where Marx is explaining, this is dialectics, this is my method. Um, you have to actually understand it as you read him, right? As you yes. read the work of yes. Marx. And, uh, and something like that started to happen to you, that you were producing a lot of material, but you suddenly had the urge of sitting down and thinking, okay, this is what dialectics is. Now, for the purpose of this uh, interview, I know that in that book you were starting to create relationships between dialectics and the concept of m the metabolic uh, relation, metabolism, metabolism, right? right? Which later became more apparent in your work. Um, can you, f for the sake of like this podcast and in the audience, explain um, very rapidly how do you perceive or what is for you dialectics and how do you relate it or is it the same thing than a metabolic, uh, meta metabolic thought, metabolic thinking in relationship to nature, the environment, society, etc.? Well, there, 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 there are, uh, I think, two aspects to this. Um, one is... Uh, coming to grips with Marx's texts. And the key text was, of course, the Grundrisse, which was, came out, the English version came out in 1973. And frankly, that had an immense impact on how I read Marx, because there he does talk about the metabolic yes. relation to nature, and there he does actually practice what dialectics, and if you want to know what, how, how to think dialectically, then you struggle with that text. Because, uh, as you rightly point out, Marx never gave you a guide as to how to do dialectics. You have to watch him do it, and he does it in, in, in the Grundrisse. So the first thing was studying the Grundrisse, and it was a very difficult text. And I don't think I really understand it, and I still to this day don't understand it. Even though it. you just finished a book I on just, it. <laughs> just finished a book on it. Yeah. But it, it played a very crucial role because all sorts of issues came up about uh, the annihilation of space by time in yes. the there. And so it was not only the environmental question and, and the metabolic relation to nature and the whole question of space and time and so on. So, so the dialectics was a, was a key Yes, was, was 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 a key uh, a key a key key text. The second thing was that all, all along when I was reading Marx, uh, there was I, I was coming up against what I would call positivist readings, yes. uh, sort of uh, like uh, treating it as a, a sort of an exercise in Cartesian logic and logical empiricism and all the rest. Mathematics, of it. almost. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I didn't. I, I never felt comfortable with that. Especially from the and, economic perspective, and, right? And therefore, the found, what was foundational for me was uh, Bertel Ullmann's text on alienation. Yes. Where, where Ullmann does not talk about dialectics in the uh, kind of formal Hegelian sense, but talk, talks about it as relationalities. 
so that you cannot understand X without understanding Y and the relationship between them. And that, of course, is the key moment when Marx writes about uh, uh, the labor process in, in Capital, where he kind of says, you know, uh, the value theory is based on uh, based on labor. The labor process is crucial, but what is the labor process? The labor process is, is human action applied to nature, and therefore uh, the metabolic yes. relation to nature says you can't understand nature without understanding uh, the labor process, and you can't understand the labor process without understanding nature. And this is what is I think is meant by... Um, a metabolic relation that yes. that you have you have you have two identifiable components, but neither of them can be understood without the other, and 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 it was that metabolic connection which began to be very uh, important uh, to me, uh, and I think I, it was partly you know using uh, what I thought was a far more satisfactory understanding of Marx through Bertel Ullmann's notion of, of relationalities and so on, and and then applying that. Uh, and, and and then using these statements yes. that Marx makes in Capital about the nature of the labor process is a, a relation to nature. One of the things that we have uh, constantly talked between ourselves um, is um, how difficult it is to convey dialectics. Uh, but in this book uh, that we're talking about, Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference, I mean, you basically say, like, you have to get this right before you even think about um, let's say trying to change or like if we are going to change the future the thinking process of our times uh, what we have learned has to change and uh, you also do it in your first lecture in uh, in the famous YouTube videos when you're discussing Capital Volume 1 right I think it's the first lecture or the second lecture where you're explaining graphically what dialectics is right that you consider it something that is is Without that, basically, there's no understanding. Am I in the right direction? Yeah, um, I think the, one, of, one of the difficulties here, however, is really concerns Marx's relationship to Hegel and Hegelian dialectics and how Hegelian dialectics works. And um, I, my, I've never been a great fan of the sort of Hegelian interpretations of Marx. I respect yeah, a lot of the work very that's been done, yeah. done on that. I yeah. respect that, but, but, but it seemed to me that it, in some ways it got in the way of what Marx was doing with, uh, with it all. And, and I, I, for that reason, I, I was sort of um, beginning to develop an interpretation of. Of, uh, of dialectics in Marx, which is very much about process-based philosophy. And I started to uh, appreciate very much what I think was the foundational text for me later on was Levins and Lewontin on dialectical biology. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I thought, here's two biologists yeah, who see, who uh, see, yes. who see the, want to understand the world dialectically. And th therefore, this is something which is opposed to this positivist reading of yes. Marx. Yes. And, and I felt much more comfortable with that yeah. and, and yeah. wanted to then apply it. But in doing that, I, I, I I think I, I was able uh, to come up with this idea that, again, is very explicit in, in, in Capital, where Marx kind of says, you, you really can't change the world without changing yourself. And you can't change yourself without changing the world. So, and, yes. that's what the, and that's mediated by the labor process. Yes. So much later on when I'm talking about urbanization, I say things like, the question is not what kind of city we want, but what kind of people we want to be. And yeah. that's a very dialectical move to yes. kind of say that actually making this thing called the city is about making ourselves. And making yes. ourselves cannot be uh, 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 done in absence of remaking the city. So it's that kind of, uh, that's how the dialectics work. There, uh, there is something in, your, in, your, uh, in that uh, text that I want to quote you because I want to add to these, uh, to integrate another concept that you, you bring as part of the dialectics, part of the dialectics. You say the following. It says, I... And in, as an individual, cannot be understood except by way of my metabolic, social, and other processes which I internalize. And you continue saying, this implies, however, that I necessarily internalize heterogeneity and a bundle of associated contradictions. So you, here you, 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 you bring you know, the necessity of part of the dialectic is that contradictory moment, right? Yes. Yeah. And how, how are you um, internalizing this at that period you know, and so on? 
No, I think that, that that's uh, that's crucially important to me. And what separates me, I think, from a, a lot of uh, Marxist interpretations is the Marxist interpretations, in a, in a way, sideline contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for me, it's it's absolutely central. Yeah. Uh, and I, I feel the contradictions internalized within me, so it's not as if I have a secure position and I exactly know what yes. what is what. I do not. I'm constantly kind of grappling with the contradictions, and I understand that people find the contradictions in, in you know, uh, for instance, economists hate contradictions, yeah, so of course, they write how they, they, wrote, that. they yeah. write a complete science which is full of non contradictions and therefore yes. is irrelevant. Everything's perfect, yeah, but it's optimum yes, or I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. in relationship. So, so I think that for me, uh, that has always been a, a very significant aspect of of uh, what the dialectic is about. And I and there are dialectical thinkers who uh, are not radical in in the sense of you know politically radical. For instance, in writing Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference, I used Alfred North Whitehead a great mm. deal. And, and Alfred North Whitehead is one of the few people who writes cogently about relational definitions of spatiality, for example, which is, is also a, ter a very important theme to me. So I don't think that, 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 uh, that somehow or other Marx has a, a, a trademark on dialectics. Yes. I think there's a lot of dialectical thinking out there that can be imported and, and, and in support of uh, the sort of work that Marx was uh, engaged upon. So in the dialectic uh, sense, I mean, we start talking about the contradictions, but I also asked the question uh, just at the beginning, which, what is the relationship of dialectical thinking and Marx's metabolic understanding of the metabolic relationship to nature, now that you bring up the question of contradiction, right? Because one thing is to understand, okay, there's a metabolic relationship, but where is, what is the contradiction here uh, in a metabolic relationship to nature? Well, uh, if, if we, we go back to the idea that uh, value, and if we defi define capital as value in motion, that value is, rests upon labor, but you can't understand labor without understanding what labor yes. is doing, and therefore there is a relation to, 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 to nature, and that the practice of labor is gonna change that world, yes, and the natural world. But the natural world is changing all the time, and it's gonna change us, so we get something like the, 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 the pandemic which comes through, or, or something like AIDS, and then you ask the question, there's something going on uh, within the natural world to which we have to respond and we have to change who we are because of the nature of that experience. Yes. So it, that is the dialectic and it's a continuous process. It's not as if somehow or other, oh, we've got it all done. Yes, okay, maybe we've got this uh, current virus under control, though I don't think we have, but yes. let's suppose we've got it under control. Well, but the next thing is going to be somewhere else. Uh, yes. And there's going to be floods coming down from uh, uh, the Himalayas and, 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 and inundating half of Pakistan. Yes. You know, so, so this is the... This is, these are the sorts of things we, we, we have to look for. So it is a, the, the, the contradiction never goes away. Yeah. And I like to make this contrast between, you know, there are solutions to problems, but there are no solutions to contradictions. Yes. Contradictions have no solution. They are therefore are perpetually there and you're perpetually involved in, in motion. Them. Yes. Perpetual emotion, and yes. I communicate with my audience that a lot. Like I said, like we cannot think about solutions. I mean, there's no solutions, right. at least for not like these key questions that we have. Right. Now, there is a, a concept that that I think uh, some some thinkers have talked, and you too, that uh, that begins to preempt Marx's understanding of nature or its metabolic relation to nature, and that concept which is a Marxist concept, would be the concept of alienation. And you started to talk a little bit about it now, right? Because it's, it's the labor, labor in vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, what we do to the environment and what humans do to the environment, and there's a whole process of alienation. Yes. Um, I wonder if you could explain to our audience what, how is that you know, concept linked. Um, I'm going to quote a part from the Economic Manuscripts of Marx, which uh, I love uh, in it. Uh, it's a part that's called Strange Labor. Right? And he's discussing right, all these right. issues. And he says, nature is man's inorganic body. Nature that is, insofar as it is to itself, a human body. Not, it, not itself human body. Nature is his body with which he must remain in continuous interchange if he is not to die. That man's physical and spiritual life is linked to nature means simply that nature is linked to itself, for man is a part of nature. 
Yes. Right? So, yes. Well, I think that there's a tendency to say that there's social you know, there's a situation and you know, put, it, put it another way. Um, this notion of a, a distinction between nature and culture. Yes. Uh, it's very common to kind of say, well, there's nature there and culture there. And then I say to somebody, well, okay, let, look around this room and tell me where the social begins and the natural ends. <laughs> You can't do it yeah. because, uh, and and I so this led me to say things which got me very into a lot of trouble of saying well, there's nothing unnatural about New York City. Yeah. yeah, in the same in the same way there's nothing un, unnatural about a beaver building dams and ants building nests and so on. There's nothing unnatural about human beings building cities. Yeah. It, it's, it's a very natural thing, yeah. and it's a reorganization of the natural world in ways which are more supposedly more. Uh, satisfying to us but then you say well is it really satisfying to us or is it satisfying to capital it, that's the question and exactly. then then i get back to the idea of well actually what what we're building out there we're build, building cities which are adequate to capital but not necessarily adequate to people yes so so this is part of the the film now this gets us back to alienation yeah uh i think it's important to understand that for instance the laborer has the capacity to labor and the laborer would like to be in charge of the capacity to labor. But in fact, the laborer has to go into the labor market and get hired by a capitalist. And so the, the laborer's capacity to labor is alienated. It belongs to capital. And then it turns out when you look at the situation of the capitalist, the coercive laws of competition are driving the capitalist whether they like it or not. So the capitalist is also alienated. So you have alienated labor and alienated capital. And they are actually creating a world, which of course, it means that there's alienation from nature. So yes. that they then go back to the economic and philosophic manuscripts and talk about the potentiality for an unalienated relationship to nature and what yes. would that look like. And, and in fact, the bourgeoisie and its own critiques has come up with ideas about this. So there's a lot of, there is some, a, a kind of the romantic tradition. There are well, of these course, sorts of things. pastoral, all those things, yes. Longing, a longing for... for, for, for nature. For, for, yeah. for, for re the re-enchantment of nature. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so it's not as if this is un, uh, unfamiliar in, in bourgeois life. It's, in fact, very, very significant. Yeah. But, but it also life. gives us, um, it puts us in a, like in a, in a se separation to understand what is nature. Because one thing that Marx is saying here in all your work, what you say is that it's impossible to separate, you know, our relationship to nature. We're all the time making it and nature is producing us, and et cetera, right? And, and, but our understanding... Um, in general, since we're educated, is that you know nature is out there, right? Like uh, I tell my students, is like let's uh, let's go to nature means you know let's go upstate or let's go uh, to the river or let's go to a mountain, right? And we always tend to, to externalize it in our language. So in our language already is is we're separate. There's already an alienation, even starting from that point. No? Yeah, no, and I, I think that the, the, the whole kind of question of, uh, you know, does, is, is, is the laborer alienated from their product? And the answer yes. is yes, they, 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 they are. And so, again, the, the, the question is the kind of uh, nature that is being created uh, through labor is no longer the kind of nature that a laborer would, might want. It has everything to do with what is necessary for, for capital. capital. Yeah. And, and so this is where the alienation, I think, r really, really comes in. Yes, that, that, that um, you know, to continue with the concepts that Marx is developing, I, I mean, from the economic manuscripts to uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts to the Grundrisse, there's a big development in Marx. Not big development, but it's certainly there's a development, a lot of questions. You just recently finished a book on the Grundrisse, uh, one of the few companions that will ever that will exist so far, you know, on, on the book. You spent years working on it. I saw you work on it like crazy. The concept of the metabolic relationship to nature is very apparent there. Uh, but it has a different tone, in my view, than from the economic and philosophical manuscripts. Yes. And I wonder... What, what is that new tone that Marx is bringing in the Grundrisse in relation to met metabolism? Uh, well, the economic and philosophic manuscripts, uh, Marx was still uh, you know, very much embedded in the Feuerbach, uh, Hegelian view, and it's an idealist construction. Yes. But the argument is basically we are alienated 
from our potentiality. And there's, uh, he uses the concept of species being. That uh, and, and, and in some ways it's a rather romantic it's, concept. It's a beautiful concept. Yeah, yeah. beautiful concept, yes. romantic concept. Yes. And, but Marx kind of says, well, that's not really what I want. And so in the Grundrisse, he changes his definition of alienation. It's not about separation from potentiality of our species being. It's about this process of labor, uh, being, of labor being actually uh, taken by capital and used yes. for something other than what labor might itself want. And, and so the alienation in the Grundrisse is a more kind of... Uh, uh, an objective situation I and mean, Marx talks about the way in which we are all of us uh, ruled by abstractions in, in, um, I'm going to read a, a quote because I selected a few quotes from the Grundrisse just for this conversation okay. right? and, and uh, hopefully I can you know, uh, kickstart a, a line of thinking from you uh, this is from Notebook 4 uh, or 5 uh, and it says it is not the unity of a living and active humanity with the natural, inorganic conditions of their metabolic interaction with nature, and hence their appropriation of nature, which require explanation, is the result of a historic process, but rather the separation between these inorganic conditions of a human existence and this active existence. It says a separation, which is completely posited only in relation to wage labor and capital. Right. So already there, he's, 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 he's telling yes. us exactly this, right? And I talk to many students and about the metabolic relationship to nature, and it's, it's a difficult thing to grasp. How are you talking about metabolism and labor at the same time? And I'm using this quote to push you to try to explain in the uh, easiest way possible, the more simplest way possible, let's say, that, I mean, how is labor in the, inserted in these metabolic relations? I think our audience could understand like the metabolic relations, but you know, where does labor get into this? You've been mentioning all the interviews so far. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me backtrack just a little bit. Um, I think the, we tend to mystify the dialectic and uh, alienation and all the rest of it somewhat. Um, and, and, and in part because our, the whole structure of our understanding of the world that we've been educated into is anti-dialectical. If you go back and you listen to kids, you know, five-year-olds and four-year-olds, actually they have a very dialectical view of the world. Uh, and, 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 every, and, and relational things. Things are completely, you know, things are inside of things and, 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 and nothing is separated out. And we spend a lot of time educating them out of yes. what might be called a dialectical understanding and, uh, and into a sort of practical understanding. Yes. So to us, uh, it's difficult. Uh, now, there are groups in society, and this is where the indigenous cultures come in, where they see perfectly well that they're living in a sentient world where things are happening and they see themselves as part of that sentient world rather than separate from it and in command of it and so on. So yes. there's a very, so we've been educated, if you like, out of the dialectical modes of thinking. And once you start to realize it's a very basic way of thinking yeah. and a very simple way very of simple. thinking. And, and, and then say, all right, well, you know, I think we can understand that, uh, you know, you, you you know the 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 problem in our society is the way in which the social is organised in such a way as to the behest of capital. Mm -hmm. So it is building cities, which have nothing not to do with what I might want. Uh, to yes. some degree, yeah, there are developers out there who may wonder what I might want and might try to do something. To but try it's to, always to extract something. It's, always, it, it's about extracting. It's about extracting and wealth and, and accumulating. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Yes. And, and, and therefore, we get the production of uh, a, a transformation of nature, uh, which is na still natural, but it is unnatural in the sense that it doesn't correspond to what my labor would should I, I would like my labor to, to, to be involved in creating. Yeah. And, and then you find, well, OK, there are dissident groups within capital who go off and, you know, go off into the woods and, and, and build something which is more to their taste and so on. So you, you'll find a, 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 a lot of dissident culture within the bourgeoisie itself which to me is also about you know, trying to kind of 
recuperate that which has been lost. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the critique of industrial capitalism is, is, is both external in the sense that you know, people don't want to, get, want to get rid of the whole thing, but it's also internal uh, to our social order. And I think that's one of the things that is, creates some confusion on the left because we suddenly find ourselves, you know, we're in, we're in some sort of demonstration against a pipeline or whatever it is, yeah. and we suddenly find this very conservative person who's kind of doesn't share our political beliefs at all but really but hates there? this uh, this desecration going on of the world around. So there is there is a, a, a kind of a complexity there, but, that, but then that's what the dialectic is always about. Mm -hmm. We're internalizing these contradictory, contradictory. kinds of features. And, and within, uh, again, to extend back to the question, it's like the, the labor part in relationship to that metabolic thing. How, can you elaborate on this? What, how, does well, it, how do we integrate? Because well, I think it's a very important concept to grasp. Yeah, but, but the, dif the difficulty with, with, with talking about this is as follows. <clears throat> I can understand it individually, and, w and I think everybody can understand it individually, that we're creating a world out there that I find obnoxious and, and don't like. And it, you know, can but, but when you start to look at it socially, in terms of the social aggregate of what is happening, uh, it becomes much more difficult. Yes. And, much and more abstract. Abstract. And, it's, and, and because it becomes that much abstract, it becomes difficult to think of I exactly what a socialist would do with the world that we're building. And, you know, I, I look at all these new buildings in New York City and I think to myself, how can we turn this into a socialist paradise? Yes. You know, and, and at that point you kind of go, well, that's right. I used to think that about driving down the New Jersey Turnpike where you've got all of these, uh, you know, uh, petrochemical and you kind of say how do i turn this into a socialist paradise so so we're then we're then kind of saying it's not only about my labor it's about the whole organization of, of social labor. labor exactly how social labor can be brought and to the alienation in which it is embedded i mean yeah, the whole yes, process yes, of alienation yes, yes. so, so that, and, and and then that becomes and and i reminded of this very much with uh, you know, this is a, a sidebar in a way but the definition of uh, productive and unproductive labor. Uh -huh. uh, we start off with thinking of the individual and we see the individual making, you know, nails or whatever. And you say there's a productive laborer and there's somebody over there who's, who's uh, sort of uh, serving the, the majesties in the, in, in, in the palace and that's unproductive labor. So we clearly understand productive and unproductive labor. Yes. But then as Marx goes on, after a bit, you kind of say, well, what, what happens when uh, uh, productive uh, labor uh, is socialized? And so we're looking at a whole factory system. And in that case, we've got all kinds of people doing all kinds of things, including the cleaners and the designers and the, and the makers and so on. And, and it's no longer an individual thing. So I yes. can't go to the individual anymore and say, you're the productive labor and you're the unproductive yes. labor. And then I go even further and say, well, actually, at the end of the day, I have to say, is the U.S. economy productive or unproductive? Mm -hmm. And, and then I have to come up with a completely different way of investigating that than simply, well, is that person productive because they're making something and that person not because they're simply serving the, 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 at, at the, at the aristocratic table, you know. Yes. So, 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 so this is also true about uh, alien, you know, alienated, how to become unalienated when, when you're looking at, you know, the, the society as a whole. And that is a, that is a very, very big question. And, yeah. and one which I don't think uh, Marx did a very good job of, of working towards. He, he says, as soon as you so socialize the labor, then you've got a different story on your hand. And, and now, of course, we have, we have these enormous corporations employing you know, thousands of people. And, and then the question is, well, well, OK, it's all alienated labor, but how do you unalienate it when, when you're actually you know, in Shenzhen, the, the producer of my computer, uh, in 2011 they're committing suicide and so on, so how can their labor process be re reconfigured and am I as a socialist going to want to have computers down the line and if so, what kind of labor is going to go into it and yes. how is it going to be collectively organized? Yeah, and that that I that that question of scale. Um, yes. uh, um, uh, we've been discussing also the concepts on the, the mass and which has to do with other other things. But the, the mass, the, the scale of things, is something that is so difficult to grasp 
uh, yes. for everyone. It yes. makes it so abstract. I mean, I, uh, as you were talking, I'm thinking, it, obviously, most of us approach uh, the environmental question from an individual perspective. Yes. I mean, like uh, we we try to recycle. Perhaps we, you know, buy the electric car. We do these, but it is so um, non. We're not used to asking questions of a collective or, right. or, a, or of a right. bigger question, right. right? And capital takes advantage of this. Right? Capital yes. um, takes advantage of our individual consumption patterns, and saying through that it's going to be resolved. No worries, right? You yes. start consuming, you know, uh, good energy, and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. yeah? And, and and you really have to ask a question um, that there's uh, there's so much work that we need to do in order to reconfigure how we think about yes. the world in general. There's in, yeah, there's intellectual work to be done. You know, as Marx calls it, mental conceptions of the world. Need to, but there also be has to be a completely new institutional structure. I'm very struck right now that, for instance, the uh, coercive laws of competition operating within the interstate system so that states were in competition yes. with each other. Uh, that has served capital very well, I think, uh, over the years because it means that a lot of technological change has come out of that through military uh, uh, research and, and, and so on. So it, in a way, it's been a very positive environment in which capital can flourish. Yes. But now there are problems emerging like, for, for instance, climate change. And where the competitive, coercive laws of competition within the interstate system absolutely Super distorted. Are, yes. are, are, yes. are unable what, to, yeah. to grapple with it. Yeah. And we see you know, big conference after big conference after big conference that goes nowhere yes. because the coercive laws of competition are between, within the interstate system are, are, are a major barrier. So at that point, there has to be a major institutional uh, reform and yes. you see no real push uh, towards that or even even a recognition so one of the things that I think we should be working on is to ask the question what kind of institutional organization would be really capable of Dealing grappling with, all the, with the with the climate change problem yes and not only that but also the others the uh, yeah. the habitat destruction and species extinctions and all kinds of things like that no this is a um a uh, super good entry into a uh, next concept I want to discuss with you, um, which is the concept of temporality or time. Because, I mean, yes, we've talked about sort of the complexity of alienation. We talk about the issue of labor. We've now talk, talked about scale, right, as an abstraction. But time makes it even more an abstraction. And time is related a lot to the things that you were talking about, that in the current conditions, when you look at the environment, the different temporalities in terms of uh, commodities, the production of commodities, access to commodities, scarcities, right, start to appear, where it makes us also it makes it more complicated to understand me me metabolic relations. I mean, one of the things that Marx did in the Grundrisse was, I think, address this, address that 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 metabolic relations happen in different times and and, and different scales, right? And I want to use this to to read a quote from from him, which I I, I really like from uh, I think it says book six, right? And he says, this change of form and matter of capital, is referring, is like that in the organic body. If one says, the body reproduces itself in 24 hours, this does not mean it does it all at once, but rather that the shedding in one form and the renewal in another is distributed and takes place simultaneously. But incidentally, in the body, the skeleton is fixed capital, right? This will go to another concept, which it does not renew. Uh, itself is the same at the same period of time as flesh and blood. So he's, he's starting to actually separate that there's so many processes within that metabolic relation yes. that are at play, right? And he says, in the human body, as with capital, the different elements are not exchanged at the same rate of reproduction. Blood renews itself more rapidly than muscle, muscle than bone, which is in respect regarded to a fixed capital and of that of the human body. And so here we are in a in the sort of entry point of a what we all know is going to be a, an absolutely terrible uh, decades and years ahead of grappling with the crisis of the environment. Yes. And how do we start understanding these temporalities that we're going to face? I mean, the scarcities in which, you know, that, that there are going to be, that the metabolic relation has been altered and it's going to be altered dramatically. And I think we're not prepared for this. Oh, I think we're not prepared, but we do know, uh, actually, uh, for instance, uh, take things like carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. 
we know roughly the rate at which they dissipate. Okay, so we, could, we can say that if there are no more carbon emissions from today onwards, then the rate of dissipation will be such that by 2050 there will be so much carbon, you know, yes. dioxide left, and we, we can make, make those calculations. Now, we can then add into that and say, well, we can't expect that we'll have zero carbon emissions, uh, but we're going to have some. So we, we, we can make these, 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 these decisions. And, but the trouble is that uh, people kind of think about it and say, well, you know, we're talking about 2050 or the end of the century. Uh, why, why am I kind of yeah. caught up in that? How do I understand that? But, but there is the problem because right now we have enough carbon emissions. If they have zero from now on, you're still going to lose much of the Absolutely. ice pack of uh, Antarctica. And, and it's going to uh, alter the whole uh, fixed capital uh, yeah, that is there yeah, and the things yeah. that are coming and so forth. So, we, so, so, yeah. so in, a, in a sense, we do know it. Um, but we can't act upon it. And this again gets back to the institutional arrangements which yes. exist in society. Uh, and, 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 and the institutional structures that have, that have grown up around uh, the, the capitalist state, in a sense, is now dysfunctional in relationship to the requirements uh, of, uh, of uh, an administrative system that can be able to act in, in, a ways, in ways which counteract these and, difficulties. And not, and not only in the sense of temporality, but in the sense of scale. I mean, one scale thing that I, well. I do... Uh, I did love, and I've been trying to get Kim Stanley Robinson, hopefully we'll get him in the podcast, um, in his book, uh, The Ministry of the Future. Uh, one of the things I love about that is that it, it really makes it so clear that this is the, the idea of a nation state, the idea of a, of a constrained state, yes. the Trumpist sort of imaginary that a border wall will somehow seal you from all the bad. So it, we all know it's not the case, right? Yes. And there is not a single... Uh, governance model, besides a capitalist, you know, ultra extraction model, um, that understands the scale of the globe in terms of right. governance. What you're talking right. about? No, 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 no. No, it's uh, it's. I think I think we were facing these difficulties, and, and a lot of this, I, you know, you've talked about it, but let me reinforce it. A lot of it has to do with the scale, yeah. at which uh, we're now of, of the problems that we're now facing. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, in instance is grasping with our with with our alienation as an individual and then as a society, then understanding that different temporalities in which it is coming. You know, meta metabolic relations, as Marx just pointed out, is just it it is about different temporalities, but importantly, the issue of scale. Now, yes. now uh, sadly, I'm gonna need to start concluding this uh, uh, interview, and I'm sure we're gonna have others in the in the coming episodes, but. I want to end up with um, something that I've told you in other occasions that I've been grasping with, and it's the idea of how do how do we face? I mean, what what is the what are the mental conceptions? What is the theoretical construct? What is my wh in which way should I approach? Uh, and I mean, I as everyone of us, uh, us should approach the coming years, and. And I think we're in a, a moment like it's an absolute emergency already. Like uh, Reverend Billy was in the podcast uh, a few podcasts ago. And he said, man, you have to accept we're in the sixth extinction. And this is already it, right? And, and that's how it's going to go. But I cannot stop but think, what is the way forward in terms of how should we think about all of this? And a word always comes to mind, which is that thing that since the 1960s, a lot of environmentalists uh, started to grapple with, with the idea of degrowth, right? Um, of, uh, that everything is just on the concept of growth, right? And I've been trying to think what concepts can we as a society begin to grasp that are not as complicated as, I don't know, alienation or this and that, right? Something that communicates better that we have to act now and completely change and stop what is happening into an absolutely different model. And that, I think, is in principle the anti-capitalist thing. Like, yeah. capitalism must stop. Yeah. Um, how do you, what do you think about this? Uh, not about degrowth or so on, but what are your views, right, on a process of approach uh, to this disaster? Well, I, as you know, in the, in, in the enigma of capital, I, I suggested that there are seven arenas of transformation, uh, technology, Relation to nature, productive forces, social relations, you know. So I'm sort of saying, look, 
we need to think about changing all of those. And somebody said to me in an interview the other day, well, what you're talking about requires a complete transformation in the mindset of people. Am I, and, and I said, yeah, that's true, but you can't go out there and ch change, say, change, change your mindset. Yes. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you want, really want to know how people change their mindsets, they do it out of experience. So we've got to find ways of, of people experiencing the world differently so that then naturally construct a mindset <laughs> See what, see what I mean? In, yeah. in, in, in other words, we could take an idealist position and say it's simply all about ideas. And if we get the ideas right, everything will work. Well, mm, it doesn't no. work that way. Yeah. Uh, it's practices that matter. And so we need to define practices. So what are our practices in, in terms of the relation to nature, for example, yes. uh, out of which we will start to recognize uh, the significance of protecting say, species diversity or, 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 or the reduction of carbon emissions? How can, we, how can we actually generate a world of experience that leads people to sort of say in their minds, yes, this is a good idea, yeah. this is what we should be doing? Yeah, and then that seems to me to be the, the crux of the problem. I don't know the answer to. Yeah, it. no, no, no one, no one of us does. But you know, it be yes, yeah, sir. And we need a so, yeah. uh, and we need a social movement that it says, okay, we need to, we need to transform all of these areas of our, of, our, of our activity. But we need to find, exp and, and, and there are some experiments going on, you know, you know, in society, but they're all small scale. And this is the difficulty. The left has, if you like, a, 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 a fetish about it's got to be small scale and intimate. And, and yes, it's great that you, you, you set up a small-scale organization and you have yes. a certain intimacy. Nothing wrong with that at all. But that is not going to deal with the, social, the big social problem we've got. And we need, we need those, those, that's where we need a, a great deal of uh, uh, innovation and, and exploration of new, of new institutional arrangements, uh, of, of, of new, new structures of daily life, uh, which are much more satisfying than the ones we have now. Um, these are these are the sorts of things where yeah. where the, there needs to be a broad as, approach, so that we don't put all our eggs in one basket and say change the ideas and everything's going to be okay. Change the technology. The technology is a big one. You know, get the right technology and everything's you know, going to be fine. It doesn't work out that way, and never has worked out that way. Uh, so what we need to do is to kind of really think about the co a collective movement uh, in which society as a whole. Uh, starts to grapple with these scale problems. Yeah, to problematize them differently. The, 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 what you were telling about, like, if we experience, you know, reminds me of uh, things that are happening right now in, the, in China, especially around the Yangtze, uh, which, uh, you know, drying up now. Yes. And um, what, what is, start, I mean, like, really startling about all of this is that this happens in a period where China is consuming as much electricity as possible. You have a lot of hydroelectric plants, electricity. Of course, they're not functioning, right. and they have to fire up carbon, right? Uh, and they have to actually extract more carbon uh, in order to burn more carbon so that they can actually go with right. the energy demands right. of a process that is also super extractive and is destroying. And this, this begs the question is like, okay, so let's imagine that China for some reason Im uh, invents like a hyper technology like in a day that uh, fusion uh, fish you know something like that you know and um, it manages to connect it directly to these power plants right and clean energy begins to be pushed in the Yangtze and all the 400 million people that depend on it uh, would that be uh, an environmental triumph perhaps right but if we see it as a scale the, all the processes that happen in the Yangtze, all the extractive processes, all the factories, all the labor exploitation, all of that remains. Yes. Right. And I assume this is what you mean. Like when, you, when you're talking about the totality of things, of many things, right. it is not possible that we just focus on one thing. Like that's part of the change right. of the mindset, right. correct? Yes. No, I'm, 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 I'm very much of that view. But uh, then, then it, it really takes a, a kind of a massive uh, yeah. uh, think tank. And if you look at the think tanks that are being built right now, they're being built and, and, and staffed mainly by the very, you know, the billionaires are, are funding a lot of the stuff and uh, they're not uh, getting into it, doing any of this stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a, an absolute change. I always urge the viewers that 
I mean, it's almost like we have we have no choice but to act on this uh, uh, in whatever our capacities are, but also trying to to join larger movements, larger movements, and build larger yes, movements. Yes. Because if we don't reach up to scale, uh, I mean, certainly we're doomed. There's a person that did a comment on one of the podcasts which says like, "Bring the vegan marmalade because we're all toast." <laughs> or something okay. like that, right? Yeah. And which I found um, very, very tragically funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, David. Well, it's a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, yeah. No. It's very nice. This is a very, very important issue, and I, I don't know quite what to do about it, but yeah, whatever yeah. we can do, I think we we should do. Yeah, I mean, like uh, d we're we're talking of organizing a large gathering or around the topic of the metabolic relationship to nature yeah right so uh, in both of our podcasts we'll let you know if that's happening perhaps yeah, yeah. some of you can join uh, virtually or in person yeah. um but uh, but we need more and more and more it's not yeah. it's not about us absolutely okay thank you very much David. thank you take care thank you bye this was another episode of cities after thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe